please continue to pray for, for Brother Bill and Miss Karen. Um, representing our congregation in the meetings that they're going to uh, beginning tomorrow. I always uh, anticipate when he's going to be gone <laughs> uh, that he's going to ask me uh, to share God's word. And it's kind of one of those things that in, in one way it's exciting and it's invigorating and in another way it scares you to death. So you start preparing the best you can and, and God leads and guides and some things you think need to be in there don't get in here. And then other things uh, after you've gone to bed you get back up and God says watch this video from Right Now Media because <laughs> there's, there's a word there in John chapter 17 that needs to be in here. And so I'm grateful for the Lord's leadership and his using the stumbling words of man and what many would say the foolishness of, of preaching to accomplish his will. We're going to be taking a look uh, in Ephesians chapter 4 beginning at verse 1. I usually try to be composed when I get up here and Josh picking those songs out uh, took me to the cross. <laughs> That's a good thing. We'll take a look at unity in God's church in, in this passage in Ephesians. Um, this graphic right here may not represent a whole lot to you. If you live with a quilter or you've been in the home of a quilter, uh, that's something that you've seen before, that pattern. It's called a double wedding ring, and the only reason I know that is because I live with a quilter. Um, my uh, mom made a quilt for us with this particular pattern, so we have this on our bed periodically. The interesting thing about it, when, when I got to thinking about it, is you really can't tell where one circle ends and one begins because it's all interconnected, and you really can't tell whether it's circles for sure or kind of a plus signs that are in a different shape. But that's what unity is supposed to be. You, you can't tell individuals from other individuals, although all of us, as we've been looking, uh, Brother Bill has been teaching that we all have individual gifts, but this idea of unity, there is one, and we're going to see seven different ones in this passage as we look through this. Another thing that kind of struck me um, in studying this passage, have you ever... Um, been waiting for a gift, maybe a birthday or, or Christmas, maybe when you were growing up. I, I couldn't wait one year to get a tape recorder. I don't know what in the world there was about a tape recorder. But I guess if you're old as I am, it was new. Um, we didn't have, you know, a memo you could record on your phone. Um, but have you, ever, have you ever been in that situation where you were just, you couldn't wait to get this gift? It was important, whatever it was, a wagon or a bike or a BB gun or I don't know. Uh, those were just some of the things growing up that, that I thought were cool. My dad taking us out and showing us how, how to shoot a 22 rifle that we couldn't hold up. So we had to lay down the back of the pickup because we couldn't hold the gun up. Have you ever had those things that you just waited for? Well, we're going to find one of the things that we're going to look at in this passage is God has given his church a gift. And I don't know, I don't want to wrap humanity around God, but it's almost like God saying, you need this gift, and I desire to give this gift to you. Just as a parent would desire to give, give good gifts to their children, I desire to give this gift to you. That's another one of the things that we're going to look at in this passage this morning. If you will stand um, out of honor for God's word as we read this. I'm just going to begin with the first, um, the first six verses. And there we've got it up on the screen. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you 
to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all, who is over all and through all and in all. Let's pray. Father, as we come again into your presence here collectively, we pray that as we look into your word, that your spirit would, would teach us. We can't understand it any other way. Help us to see clearly the things that, that we need to see and help us to, to hear intentionally with, with hearts and minds to do your will. Thank you for the things just in the past couple of weeks that, that have come to my mind in studying this passage. I pray that you would help us, intercede for us, cause us to know you more and more and be willing to love one another more and more, which is necessarily an outcome. Draw us together in following you and loving you in Jesus' name. Thank you. you. May be seated. We're going to take a look at at this passage, verses one through sixteen total, and I want to kind of take a look at these um, in five different headings. So the first is the foundation of unity, and this is just one of the things that Paul calls everyone to. In many of his writings, in, in 1 Corinthians and Philippians and, and here in Ephesians, he, he calls the churches to, to, to unity. And then an exhortation for unity uh, that we just read in verses 1 through 3, and also there's elements of those unities, of the unity, and then the gifts for unity. And then we'll end with the results. What happens when all of these things are combined together? What does it, what does it produce? What's its result? What comes to mind when you think of the word foundation in this first point, the foundation of unity? The dictionary defines foundation as a basis upon which something stands or is supported. It's a basis that something stands or is supported. We think of a foundation of a home. We had a guy that bought a house in, in our addition, and the foundation wasn't square. He was just going to add a second story onto the house, but come to find out, the foundation wasn't the way it needed to be. So he had to pour a foundation, take everything off of that foundation that existed, completely demolish the entire home. There wasn't, a, there wasn't a two before left on that foundation. And he had to re-square it up and put another four inches on top of the foundation that existed. Why? Foundation's critical. If, if the foundation wasn't square, there wasn't anything in that house going to be square. <laughs> and if it's not secure, there's nothing that's going to be built on that foundation that's secure. Unity in God's church seems to be this type of thing for, for the Apostle Paul. It seems as if he's, where, whoever he's writing to, He's saying this, this is a foundational topic that you need to make sure that you understand and you need to make sure that you're living this, that you're striving toward this. As we'll see, we're not the ones that provides this, but we're the ones responsible for keeping it. Unity in the first century church, kind of where we'll begin. The Apostle Paul writes... Um, to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 6 verse 5 about being united together in the likeness of his death. And then we also see it in his first letter to the church in Corinth. We see this passage in uh, chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. For just as the body is one and has many members 
and all of the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. And he also writes to the church, to the church at Philippi, in uh, chapter two, verses one through three. So, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. There's an entire message right here. I mean, look at, look at the movement here in this passage and the thought process, encouragement in Christ, comfort in love, particip participation in the Spirit, and then do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Easy to do, right? No problem with that. We can move on. That's one of the things that we've got to make sure that it's, a, it's a, at the forefront of what we're thinking about when we're thinking about unity. Paul had much firsthand experience with the problem of disunity, especially in the church. Most of the first three chapters of 1 Corinthians, as we've been studying recently, deals with factions and discord within the Corinthian church. Paul knew the harm such infighting could, could, could cause, and he expressed this in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. He said, but I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? You hear how he contrasts the things that we have just looked at with unity and how he contrasts of where this church at Corinth was, what was happening within that body and how it looked to him. This is how he saw disunity. It's logical that he would exhort believers at Ephesus and everywhere to maintain unity. As we've seen here in our text today, he says, be eager to maintain the unity of spirit in the bond of peace. With this being a foundational topic, the thing that kind of made me think through is, well, how is it foundational for us? If it was foundational as we've just read in the first century church, how is this foundational for us? And one of the things that I was brought back to is this unity and foundation in the context of our lives here at Bethel. And one of the things that I thought of was our covenant that we read every month. Brother Bill has been um, committed in leading us to set some things foundationally in our congregation. Years ago, when we looked at our, our, our bylaws, it had listed of over a dozen different groups in the church and what their functions were. And that was just about the beginning and end of our bylaws. Nothing wrong with that necessarily being in bylaws, but there's much, much more that needs to be discussed if you're talking about the foundation of an organization, especially the foundation of a church of Jesus Christ. There, there, there should be more there. Well, let's look at this, uh, our covenant that we read. Listen for unity here, okay? Since by divine grace we have been brought to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and commit ourselves to him. Do you hear unity? And upon our profession of faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, relying on his gracious aid, 
we do now solemnly and joyfully renew our covenant with each other. You hear unity? In baptism, in belief, in repentance, in faith. And then, first thing. <laughs> what is the first thing that we're going to commit ourselves to do as we repent, as we believe, as we work together and pray for the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace? Also in our, our bylaws, um, deacons are to be zealous to guard the unity of spirit within the church in the bonds of love and peace. Discipline of members. The study of the New Testament reveals clearly that church discipline was an integral part of the local church life. It serves to maintain unity, purity, and faithfulness in the early church. having leadership that we have here at the helm that very generously comes in and, and waits for at least a year and then just begins asking questions. What about our constitution and bylaws? Well, I didn't know there were two such things and why they were different. <laughs> The unity that we're speaking of here in Ephesians is not only foundational for Paul in all of the churches, it's foundational here. And if we neglect that deacons are to be zealous to guard the unity of the Spirit, if we neglect discipline of members, we will forfeit unity. In the letter to the church at Ephesus, Paul, having explained the unity of Jewish and Gentile believers and having prayed for that unity through mutual experience in Christ's love, Paul now showed how they were to walk in unity. This is accomplished by gifted people given to the church by Christ so that the body may grow in all areas. So let's take a look at this next part here. Chapter 4 verses 1 through 3, an exhortation for unity. Paul says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Paul exhorted them to walk or live a life worthy of their calling. This idea of, of worthy, it means equal weight. And you've seen the justice system logo, right, that has the, the balance. This is, this is kind of the image that came to mind uh, when he talks about worthy living a life worthy of your calling. That means there should be an equal balance between the calling and our conduct. Those things should be equally balanced. We shouldn't have a calling that far outweighs our conduct. The calling that we've been called to live a worthy life needs to be maintained, it needs to be balanced with how we live our lives. Believers' attitudes are also important. Paul lists three virtues that are to enhance our walk. So these, he, he speaks to character of living a life worthy. The first of these is humility. Now, you remember in the Greek culture, humility was one of those things that um, it wasn't an attribute. It wasn't something that was admired. Matter of fact, it was, it was typically for slaves. That was one of the things they were supposed to be concerned with is humility, not everybody else. But he says, we should be completely humble in our daily walk. And as we've seen in some other passages, this is opposite of what pride looks like. It's opposite of what selfishness looks like. 
This virtue is listed first because of Paul's emphasis on unity. Pride promotes disunity. Humility promotes unity. And he also encouraged them to counteract their pride, which was also to enable obedience to and dependence on God. The second one here, gentle or meek. This is the opposite of self-assertion. Rudeness. Harshness. One who is controlled by God may be angry, but at the right time and never with the wrong motive or at the wrong time. We see Moses known as one of the meekest men, yet he got angry when Israel sinned against God. Christ was meek and humble in heart, yet he became angry at how the Jews were using the temple. So this idea of gentleness or meekness it doesn't necessarily mean that we're devoid of anger, but it's, it's anger for the things that make God angry. It's not anger for the things that make me angry. And then third, believers should exhibit peace. I'm sorry, patience. Patience is um, the spirit which never gives up, for it endures to the end, even the end of times. It is self-restraint which does not hastily retaliate a wrong. Attitudes of humility and gentleness and patience foster unity. So having stated these three virtues, Paul then states the manner in which they are to be carried out in one's conduct bearing with one another in love and making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. The the character attributes that he's outlined for us of humility and gentleness and patience now now kind of bring forth uh, conduct, and this is what that conduct looks like. Bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. To me, it just, it seems like every time when we look at Scripture, and especially in my life, if there's a difficulty in my life, someplace where my life's not aligning with God's Word, I see it here in conduct. But that's not the real issue. The real issue is my heart. The real issue are these things that Paul just outlined about humility and gentleness and patience. If I don't have those attitudes in me, it's impossible for my conduct to to look like this. So I may see this, and matter of fact, I think a lot of times God puts us in situations to where we see our own hearts. We, we see our conduct which reflects our own heart. So here's this conduct. Here's what it looks like when believers are aligned with God, unified with him and with one another we will bear with one another in love. If you have parents, if you have children, if you have a spouse, if you have siblings, you will have an opportunity to bear with someone. Now this bear does not mean I'm going to clench my jaw and I'm going to get through it one way or another. That's not how do we know that? Well, the, the attitude of my heart isn't humility, gentleness, and patience with that conduct, <laughs> right? Christians are not to make unity, but keep unity. Why can't we make unity? That's not what it says here. It doesn't say make unity. It says we need to keep it. What God made in creating the one new man in Ephesians chapter 2. We are to to keep this unity through the bond which consists of peace. Concern for peace will mean that Christians will lovingly abide with each other even when they have differences. 
The maintenance of true spiritual unity should be the continual concern of every believer. Being diligent, he says in our passage. This also means to make every effort. It basically means to haste. In this context, it's, it's also having diligent and holy zeal. This striving to keep unity is not something that is supposed to be taken half-heartedly. Pursued casually. And, and you can tell in, our, in the covenant that we read and, and in our guiding documents that it's, it's serious. It, it should be serious for the deacons and it should be serious for every other member. The unity Paul speaks of is not man-made. It is not created by a church. It is not the work of a denomination or any type of a movement. He's referring to inner unity that binds all true believers. Have you ever been somewhere out away from here or maybe just meet someone that you don't know and you just kind of begin a conversation and there's just something there and you kind of wonder, I wonder, I wonder, what it, I wonder if they're a believer. So you kind of keep, continue talking to them, asking a few questions, and you say, hey, are you, are you religious? Do you believe in God? Do you maybe attend a church or some, anywhere? Are you aligned with any kind of denomination? And you hear their story. And I found this out with a guy at work. And, and he asked me, it, this conversation was just really beginning, and he said, um, he said, well, how would you describe your religious belief? And I was, well, probably kind of historic Southern Baptist. And he said, you mean historic like the 1689 confession? And I was like, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, where did that come from? All of a sudden, never met this guy before, all of a sudden, there was unity. We knew of a common love. We knew of a common bond. We served a common savior. Amazing. Still have good conversations on the phone. It is the unity that's generated by the Holy Spirit and expressed elsewhere by the Apostle Paul when he writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and also in Romans chapter 8 when he says, for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. There are many members, but one body. And that unity here that he's speaking of is held together by the bond of peace, which is a spiritual belt that surrounds and binds believers together. That's, what we, that's, that's the unity that he's talking about here. In contrast... Unbelieving world has, uh, they have no basis, they have no foundation to understand what this looks like. And when you first experience that and you walk into a congregation that in, like we just read, they're bound by this spiritual belt that surrounds and holds them together, it's an amazing thing to watch. Amazing. People coming together, sending out a call that we've got a young child in the hospital, and people coming together. A pipe burst in somebody's house, and I finally had to tell people, we got enough people here, don't, don't come. <laughs> We're, we have plenty of people here, but thank you. How much food did you guys get this past week? <laughs> Ashley just went like this. We had an opportunity to, to bless and love this family just by bringing food. And they have plenty of food. When you walk into this situation and you see that I am thinking more of you than I'm thinking of myself, and you see that done throughout an entire group of people, it's, 
It's glorious. It's unexplainable. Because why else would I consider you more important than me? You're not going to get that in our culture. Everything says I need to be looking out for number one. (laughs) Well, I do. But it just so happens that that number one is not me. It's God. As long as the world emphasizes self-centeredness and and that self-centered feeling, prestige, rights, true harmony will never be achieved. Paul further emphasizes the definition of spiritual unity in verses 4 through 6 by listing the features that are most relevant to authentic Christian doctrine and practice. That brings us to the element of unity. In verses 4 through 6, listen for unity here. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all, who is over all and through all and in all. There's a lot of ones and alls here. Seven elements here. Paul listed these seven elements of unity centered on three persons of the Trinity. These provide the basis for spiritual unity that should exist in in a body of believers. One body refers to the universal church, all believers. One spirit. This is the Holy Spirit who indwells the church. One hope. The words, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, indicates that all believers have a common hope regarding their future with God. A confidence that began at the time they were called to salvation. One Lord refers to Christ, the head of the church. One faith speaks to faith which is exercised by all Christians in Christ their Lord. One baptism refers to a believer's identification with Christ in his death. Water baptism is the idea that by a single act, uh, a single act, believers demonstrate their spiritual unity. One other thing that in more recent days we've also seen just regarding this idea of baptism. In addition to baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Brother Bill has also reminded us of why. And this speaks of unity. He says, we baptize you in the name of the Father. Why? Because you belong to his family and you're going to love one another as brothers and sisters. Do you hear unity in that? (laughs) You can't stumble around it. In the name of the Son, why? Because Jesus is now your king and you are to serve him as he served you. How does that speak to unity? If all of us are committed in being focused on and serving one king, We all have to be on the same page. It'll it'll happen. In the name of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit has now not only given you new life through regeneration, but is going to empower you to be his missionary to the world. Now you are commissioned to the great commission to make disciples who make disciples. (laughs) Amazing. Back to our list of the elements, the seven elements of unity. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. This refers to God the Father and his relationship to all believers. He is over all. He is over all them as their sovereign. He lives through them and manifests himself in them. A 
I want us to think about this, and I, I put this quote up here. This is one of the things when I was just kind of reading through that it, it, it literally stopped me in my tracks. I've just never heard of unity described this way. A.W. Tozer says, has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos all tuned to the same fork are automatically tuned to each other? Isn't that interesting? They are of one accord by being tuned not to each other, but to another standard to which one must submit individually and bow. <laughs> Isn't this great? I mean, it literally, I just, I stopped. I can't create unity with me and you. That, that's not how, what we do. I, I don't compare myself to you. I don't... The biggest issue is that we are tuned to one standard. Those are the ones that we just looked at. That's the standard that we are all tuned to. I think the next slide. So now let's... Great application, now what does that mean for me? So 100 worshipers meet together, each one looking away to Christ are in the heart nearer to each other than they could possibly be were they to become united, conscious, and turn their eyes away from God to strive for closer fellowship. I don't need to try to engage you in unity so that we are united in fellowship. We need to make sure that we meet together, each one looking to Christ. We're going to be nearer in heart with each other than we could ever be any other way. Brother Bill's referred several times to, in a marriage relationships, the, the, the triangle where man and woman are across the bottom and Christ is at top, if, if each man and each woman is working intently to become more and more like Christ, the absolute outcome must be that they're closer together. They will be more united than they could ever be had they been trying to get along with one another. By pursuing Christ, living in a way that honors him in that relationship, they have to be closer together. Same way with worship. The next thing are the gifts of unity. After discussing the basis of unity, Paul now analyzed the means of preserving that unity by the blood, or by the body, um, that means of the various gifts. In verses 7 through 11, previously Paul discussed the unity of the entire church, and now he discusses the diversity within the church. Each believer is to function in Christ's body by God's enablement, proportionate to the gift bestowed on him. In the end of verse 8, Paul speaks of Christ giving gifts to Christians. The gifts to the church are gifted people. The subject he is emphatic that Christ himself gives the gifted people in verse 11 that he expands on further. In verse 11 it says, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors, teachers. These are the four gifts. God decided in his sovereign will that he was going to gift the church of the Lord Jesus Christ with some gifts. What does it look like if I receive a gift and I kind of look at it and, oh, thank you. And I go on about my merry way. What does that tell you if you're the one that gave me that gift? What about worse yet, 
If someone gives you a gift and you go, yeah, this really wasn't what I wanted. <laughs> or maybe you're real subtle about it and you just say, but you happen to keep the receipt for this? <laughs> Why? Eh, I thought I'd uh, get me something else. Something that I want. Apostles and prophets were already mentioned in chapter 2 and in, and in chapter 3 as a foundational gifts. Apostle means one sent as an authoritative delegate. Prophets were given to the church to provide edification, exhortation, and comfort. Evangelists, those who proclaim the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ to unbelievers, they're primarily engaged in spreading the gospel. Pastors, teachers are listed together because it refers to two characteristics of the same person. Pastor, teacher is a person who is pastoring believers while at the same time instructing them in God's ways. These are teaching shepherds. Now whether some of these gifts are still in play or not, depending on how you define and understand those or not. The point here, when we're speaking in this context of unity, God gave every congregation that's his a gift. Here's the gift. What are you doing with the gift? That's the challenge for us. How am I receiving that gift? Thank you, I guess. God, did you happen to have a backup? Because this gift isn't what I was looking for. <laughs> God, do you have a return policy? I was just wondering because I don't think this one's working out. Have you ever looked a pastor as a gift from God? I asked Brother Bill one time, I said, man, how do you, <laughs> you know, how do you deal with, with all the different perspectives and pulls? And he said, you know, when I was in, in seminary, he said it was described this way. You take a, take a group of people, put them in a football stadium, and in the, in the, across the field, you put all of their idols, everything that they love and treasure outside of Christ. Blindfold the pastor, spin him around, have him start walking around. What's he going to do? Well, it's inevitable at some point he's going to start bumping into some of these idols and knocking them over. Well, what's the crowd going to do? Goodness, brother, thank you for pointing out that I'm not aligned with Christ in this, ma in this matter, and, and I need to repent. <laughs> or... He's got to go. We need to be very cautious. We need to be very intentional about what we're doing with the gifts that God has given the church. The last part, the result of unity to prepare God's people for works of service. How long are these gifted people to minister? Until all the churches reaches these goals. And I've skipped a slide or two, I think, brother. Yeah, go on. Here are the goals that these gifts that have been given to the church are to work toward. Unity of the faith, knowledge of Christ, spiritual maturity, sound doctrine, and authentic loving testimony. This is what's described in this last part in verses 12 through 16. God does not equip us to stagnate but to serve. We are not gifted and edified in order to be complacent or self-satisfied, but in order to do the work of service as described in this passage.
Let's look at John chapter 17. Before Jesus was crucified, the great high priest carried future believers into the holy presence of his Father. And here's what he said. I do not ask for these only, those that were with him, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Who's that? Well, ultimately, that's me. That's you. What was his prayer for them? That they may be, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. That was his prayer. In addition to Paul's thinking this is, is, is a foundational thing, and in, in addition to the gifts that he's given, in addition to these elements, <laughs> Jesus prays that we will be one just as he and the Father are one. What will be the outcome of this prayer being make manifest in this congregation? What will be the outcome? The world may believe that you have sent me. Amazing things. If you're here tonight, I'm sorry, <laughs> this morning, if you're here this morning, and you do not, you do not know of, of this unity. You haven't, you haven't really understood or really a lot of this or understand how it could work. I'd love to introduce you to the Lamb of God who was slain for all who will believe. And you place your faith and trust in him. Be united with him. If you're here this morning and you have been united with God through Jesus Christ, carefully consider the results of unity that this passage declares. A unity of faith, a deep knowledge of Christ that comes from prayer and faithful obedience to God's word. Manifesting qualities of spiritual maturity, holding to sound doctrine and reaching out to proclaim the gospel driven by authentic love for God and for others. These are the results of this unity that Paul so desired for this church to have and that Christ desires for us to have. Let's pray. Father, as we think through this passage, we look at it and we just... Sometimes it just seems like I, I'm not sure how I can get there. And yet, that is a part of your plan. Us realizing that we can never attain unity with one another, that we can only have unity with you, and as an outcome of our unity with you, we will have unity with one another. Help us to carefully consider the attitudes and the characteristics that describe unity and the outcome that we'll be mature, driven to be one with you. Father, work in, in our hearts and in our lives to call us to that. We pray in Jesus' name.